Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News special panel discussion on positive personal career and organization impacts from study abroad. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. And I'm also the director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. LMU is one of 15 universities in the country that received these prestigious cyber grants. The LMU Cyber serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners by connecting the workforce and technological needs of the U.S. business community with international education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. companies and industries, LMU Cyber has been offering special lecture series on various topics of international business that need our attention. Today, we have prepared a great program to discuss the benefits of international education and exchange worldwide as part of the programs to celebrate International Education Week. International Education Week was created as a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and Department of Education to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global market and attract future leaders from abroad to learn and exchange experiences. LMU has also joined American Council on Education's Internationalization Lab last year to reinforce its internationalization efforts. I've worked as a member of Education Abroad Group, which evaluates LMU's current engagement with Education Abroad programs to increase student interest and participation in education abroad opportunities. Today, we have invited several LMU alumni who participate in the various forms of study abroad programs during their time at LMU to share their experiences and testify impacts on their personal life and professional career. They'll be joined by Ms. Gina Tesla, formerly Director of Commercial Business Services at Microsoft, and currently she's a VP of Sustainability and Social Impact at Cooper Software in Seattle. She will discuss the valuable assets that employees with a study abroad or other early international experience bring to an organization, thus making them more attractive to employers. Now I'd like to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Charles Vance, who's going to moderate panel session today. Dr. Vance is a professor of management and human resources at LMU. He has had considerable experience as a consultant in training, curriculum development, and broader human resource development applications for many corporations and nonprofit organizations in America, Asia, and Europe. He has also served as a guest lecturer at several universities around the world. Dr. Vance has held the U.S. Fulbright teaching and research appointments in Austria and China. He has co-authored or authored numerous articles and three books, including Managing a Global Workforce, which is co-authored with me. Charlie, thanks for joining us today. And now I'd like to turn the program over to you. Great, thanks, you. thanks Young Sun. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you and uh, to, uh, to share uh, uh, through these wonderful uh, people to help facilitate their uh, experience sharing of their uh, experiences and also looking from a global perspective. Um, when we talk about study abroad, I would like to uh, make it clear that definition is, uh, is broader than what it may be commonly uh, considered. We have several panelists here that have had different kinds of study abroad or international learning experiences that have been extremely powerful. Uh, it, also, it's a pleasure that uh, with several of them, I have been abroad as part of their international uh, experience. But as with our Jesuit university, as uh, one of our key values is the development of the whole person. 
And we are convinced that uh, international education and the experience of study abroad and other early pre-career international experiences uh, are uh, essential, are very powerful in the development uh, of the whole person. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to have uh, join us uh, uh, several uh, uh, alums. Uh, one actually who's, uh, I, I'm hoping for his sake, is, is asleep at this time. I will introduce them <laughs> one at a time. Uh, the, the, our first one is uh, Justin Allen. The reason he's asleep is because uh, he's in the Netherlands. Uh, Justin uh, uh, graciously uh, recorded a, a message that uh, we wanted to share. Uh, and uh, to from his perspective, he represents a kind of the model of someone who does who goes abroad for a semester. I met uh, Justin uh, several years ago when he was in our bond program, in bond Germany for a fall semester. I had a special course that involved students uh, going out and doing several field learning experiences uh, rather than just within a classroom, uh, consulting projects and other kinds of intercultural uh, activities and assignments. And that was part of his uh, study abroad program, along with regular classroom experiences with other American students uh, in Bonn, Germany. Uh, uh, Justin uh, will, will uh, in his video, will talk a bit about that experience, but as well as how that has had an impact upon him. Our subsequent uh, uh, panelists will, will do the same in sharing a little bit about their experience and uh, its impact on their, uh, their uh, pre-career and, and current, uh, uh, current uh, career experiences. Justin, just as a little introduction, uh, graduated with his degree in accounting in, in 2004. Uh, he's served uh, several years with KPMG and then, uh, as he'll describe, uh, uh, made a, a change and moved to the Netherlands. Eventually, from KPMG there, uh, has worked with Nike. He's now the um, accounting director of strategic investments with Nike in the Netherlands. So uh, uh, we will uh, go ahead and play his video as our first uh, person introducing the 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 example of, of a study abroad experience that is a semester away. Professor Vance, uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm calling you from uh, the Netherlands uh, where I'm working at uh, Nike's uh, international headquarters in Hilversum, right outside of Amsterdam. Um, I guess to start off with, I am a graduate of 2000, 2004, did the study abroad program in uh, 2002, fall of 2002. And my journey from LMU to where I'm at today, so I did the study abroad program in 2002, but I, after graduating, I got, a, I got a Bachelor of Science in Accounting. Um, I started working at KPMG Los Angeles uh, right out of school, so I got hired uh, uh, from, the, from the accounting program. Worked in LA for four years. Uh, met some great people there, and one of those people was actually on an international assignment from the Netherlands, uh, who became a, a close friend and a manager. Uh, so, still living in LA, but you know, loved it there, but need to expand my horizons and looking to travel. So, I had loved my study abroad program, and uh, you know, Amsterdam was near the Bond program where I did my study abroad. So. Got the opportunity to do a three-year rotation in KPMG Amsterdam. Uh, got to work with international clients, uh, international uh, colleagues. Um, and there I met my wife who wasn't at KPMG, but uh, she was Dutch. And um, we, my, my rotation uh, was over and came, I came back to KPMG San Diego uh, my my Dutch girlfriend at the time came with uh, came with me. We were there for two years. 
she got pregnant and then it was like, we're going back to the Netherlands. And I knew that if we were leaving KVMG San Diego, we're probably not coming back to San Diego ever again. So we're here in the Netherlands. Uh, I got an opportunity to work at Nike. I've been at Nike for eight years now, so, uh, since 2013. I am a director of accounting in their strategic investments and SGNA, which is a fancy way of saying I'm overseeing their sports marketing portfolio, their advertising, and what we call demand creation. Um, we set up policies and procedures for you know the uh, how to account for things in their PL. Um, so uh, having a great time. I mean, being able to use my background in accounting, but also just enjoying the international culture of, of, of being over here in Holland. Uh, we've got three kids now, um, and looks like we'll be staying here for quite a while. Um, let's see, what are the, in, the things that I greatly enjoyed or what were impactful from an international experience? Um, first off, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't hugely encourage you to do an international experience um, and, and do a study abroad if you can uh, with, 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 with Loyola Marymount or whatever university you do. But, you know, you get out of your comfort zone. Um, you see, you get different experiences. I mean, I got to, you know, Europe, you get to see uh, Paris, London, uh, Milan, um, every country, every different culture is uh, within a short distance and you're just out of that, uh, you know, uh, I want to say US based world of how you do things. And you, you start to learn that there are different ways of doing things. And you also start to learn a little bit about yourself on how, um, you know, personally and professionally, how you grow and how you adapt to new surroundings. And it, it's very challenging at first, but you, you, you realize how resilient you are and you learn a lot of different things. So, you know, just coming, you know, so the study abroad program is absolutely gonna be an, an, an introduction to that. And you meet different people and you, you know, you, you, you look at the US from afar and you learn different things. You know, when I came over here from uh, KPMG and I started doing accounting in the Netherlands versus the US, it was, you know, just the way they documented things, the way that they worked with, you know, you worked with your clients and what was expected of you, what you wore to work. Things were just different, you know, it just wasn't, you know, it took you out of your comfort zone, like I said, but it was just a eye-opening experience. And you get a culture shock, you know. Um, you know, not everybody speaks your language. You just can't easily find out how to do things like you would do at home. But you learn to adapt and you challenge yourself and, it's, and, and, and you just become stronger and wiser and more experienced for it. At Nike, I, um, I work with, like, so we have, we have offices in pretty much every country in the EU and South Africa. We, we have regular conversations with Italians, um, people from the UK, Germans, uh, French. They have different styles um, and they have a lot of, uh, you know, great ideas and, and, and you get to hear those different ideas and, and work with different people. Um, people on my team, I got people from New Zealand, I got people from the US, um, uh, and, and I got people from greater Europe and it's just, you know, you're working with different people and you get, you just expand your ideas and learn different things. And, you know, when you talk to your colleagues in the U S who haven't had the opportunity to work in, in Europe, like you have, you understand how U S centric their mind frame can be. And it's not bad. It's not a bad thing, but you 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 start to learn like their their knowledge of of how the company and how we should run processes in this company are very U.S. specific. They don't have multiple currencies. They don't have different legal jurisdictions. They don't have different requirements per different country that they have to deal with. So there's challenges that they just think this is how you achieve it. Um, and this is the U.S. way of doing things, and you understand that. 
but you also have this different experience being here that there are other things to consider. And it's even though it's a US company, there's different rules that exist outside of the US. So it's a bit, it's it's humbling, but it also um it, it gives you energy and, and you learn something new. So um I have just, you know, it's it's I don't know if I will come back to the U.S. I think also from a family perspective, I, I, I'm here. But, um, you know, it's it's an amazing experience. I, I'm very glad that Professor Vance has uh, invited me to do this. He's encouraging you guys to get these experience. If you do have the opportunity to do it, whether in your studies, whether professionally, um, I think that you will never regret that opportunity and personally and professionally it'll always be um, something you will appreciate is there anything more professor vance i can uh, that i missed or i can uh, so, also talk to you so uh, you, you mentioned kind of the uh, you learn resilience uh, in the study abroad experience or at least you begin to uh, learn that, that you can bounce back, uh, you can, uh, you, you especially learn there are different ways of doing things, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are, uh, are there other kinds of things that stand out to you from your actual experience that, that made you different? Uh, self, self-awareness you mentioned, kind of getting to know yourself mm -hmm. better. Anything else that stands out from the study abroad experience? You know, it's, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you some more concrete examples, you know, but I, I think when I, I living, so growing up, I grew up in Vegas and then I lived in Los Angeles and, you know, you, you, you know, I never, I never had the idea of learning another language. I never thought, you know, I, I just figured the way of things of, of how we worked in LA and how we worked in Vegas and how you communicate and how they, you know, buying a house, how you engage every, every little element of your life, you just feel comfortable and you know how to find out how to do things. When I came and I, and I kind of talk about the resilience, you come over here and you get, and I talk about culture shock and you see how other, you know, uh, other people are doing things and it's not used, it's not the way that you're used to it. You don't know how to find out how, um, you know, you don't know if you're having trouble with your landlord or you're having trouble with setting up your cell phone is something as simple as that. Or even in the work environment, how are we documenting our specific controls for accounting? Or how do I engage with this, uh, the, the, these different people in other countries if they're not responsive to me? Whereas in the U.S., you expect them to bow down to the accountants. You have to, you have to adapt your, your language. I never thought about those things, but it was very, actually, to be honest with you, my, uh, not in the study abroad program, but when I came over here for KPMG, after probably a month, I was already like, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to go home because it was such, it was such a, a shock to my nerves on having to do all these things that were so easy in the U.S., but it were so hard here. And frankly, family was like, you, "You're not coming home. You gotta, you gotta stick this out." And you, but and then you slowly, you you slowly like, "Hey, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to drive stick shift. I'm gonna learn how to learn some new language. I'm going to learn how. Um, I'm gonna watch how my colleagues are doing something, and I'm not gonna try and enforce the way I do things to them, but maybe I'll adapt how I do things. So, you know." Everybody around me in the U.S. You kind of felt like we all understand how we do things and how we get things done. And then everything, when you came here, everything got blown up. And so now you, it kind of just kind of turned a perspective on like, you know, everything that I feel comfortable with, you can be uncomfortable, but you can learn new things to do. And, and, and that kind of thinking, I think I really appreciate after, after, being abroad you know it's just it never would have challenged you professionally and personally if you didn't step out of the comfort zone which i think 
in large part was was the U.S. and just how they, you know, how things work there. So for students uh, that are considering study abroad, what kind of preparation would you recommend that they do to uh, in, in either looking for that uh, during their undergraduate years or maybe after they graduate some volunteer international program or what kind of preparation do you recommend? Um, let's see. Um, you know, I, th I, I, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say to turn down any sort of uh, uh, opportunity. If, I mean, if 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 you're with LMU and LMU has an opportunity to go to Bonn, even though Bonn was a um, a small smaller city, you have access to the big countries. You know, I it, I would you know for a study abroad program, I would say keep your mind open. You know, uh, all these places can teach. If I went to China, it would be a different you know, experience altogether, but it would be equally as beneficial. So I think be open to new things, um, how to plan for it, you know, be ready for a shock, but, you know, it's something that you, you'll, you know, when I, when I was doing my, uh, when I was planning for my uh, rotation with KPMG, I actually got an offer to Adelaide, Australia, and then I got an offer to um, Switzerland, and then I also got the offer to Amsterdam. And so that was a case where it's like, well, if I work in Adelaide, the only accounting world they do is mining. And I thought, well, that's not very transferable if I ever decide to come back to the US, mining, I don't know. So I thought about that element, like what, what kind of experiences are you gonna get that might be transferable to something you wanna do later? Switzerland, beautiful, but, you were going to be living in a village near the mountains, which is beautiful. But then I contrasted that with Amsterdam, which had a more international presence. And I thought to myself, from my perspective, if, if, if my career in, in accounting is going to be successful, I need to go where some international companies are. So those were my thinking with Amsterdam. And plus it's a fun, fun town. For a study abroad, you know, uh, everything you do should be learning and should be fun. So it's, you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, if you're going to go with professional advance, you work with them, you know, you love the guy, you know, go through his program. If there's another, you know, so make sure you also go with a, a program that you feel comfortable with, but preparation, it's just open mind. And, and, and I think you'll learn anything um, anywhere you go. Yeah. Justin's model, as I mentioned, is kind of a semester abroad. And that's there, uh, and I encourage you uh, to check with our uh, those, our students or others viewing or interested in, in study abroad to check with our study abroad office and investigate the many different kinds of semester programs that we have in Germany and others that we co-sponsor with other schools and other programs. That's, that's an excellent experience, a semester away. Students often do their uh, their junior year, um, uh, fall or spring semester. We also have a model that within our uh, Center for Asian Business that I've been involved with, with a, a, uh, a course for juniors and seniors that we study about global sustainability during the spring semester. And then we uh, go to uh, visit Seoul, Korea, and Tokyo, Japan, and investigate sustainability issues there on a two-week tour. Somewhat similar, the freshmen and sophomores have a, a course uh, of Asian cultures. Uh, we had a, a, an alum, uh, Fran Magdalene, who uh, was going to join us, is not feeling well due to a COVID booster, apparently. And, uh, but she, uh, participated in this program as a freshman. I asked uh, 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 Dr. Marky Jones, who's helping us with this program today to fill in a little bit more about that program that, that uh, Fran did. Thank you, Dr. Vance. I'm happy to share about the Exploring Asian Culture course. Um, as you mentioned, this course is geared for freshmen and sophomores. And we've been running this program for um, over 10 years now, 
Um, the course is a spring course and it teaches, uh, uh, gives an overview of the political history of China, Japan, and Korea. And uh, students learn about culture and, and introductory to business practices. Um, and then after the semester ends, if, um, they're taking their um, lectures. They'll spend uh, one week in South Korea and one week in China. Um, and so we've had uh, over about 150 students um, so far that we have sent on this program. And many of the students have had um, just amazing um, experiences and have um, come back to share those with us. So we hope that, that students will be interested in taking this course. Um, then the next time it'll be offered will likely be next year. All right, thank you very much, uh, Marky. Um, we have other kinds of models or examples besides a, uh, a two week summer uh, program after a semester of study or a regular semester uh, study abroad. Uh, even for graduate study, uh, international study opportunities are uh, highly advisable uh, where, uh, where at all possible. I have had a pleasure uh, to be involved with our MBA program for several years and it's uh, uh, comparative uh, management systems program in which uh, faculty would work with a team of students uh, for over a year, and at the in in after the school year, we would uh, go visit three to five different countries uh, uh, related to a particular research topic. I had the great pleasure of uh, working with uh, with Namdi Nosu, who is our, our next panelist. Namdi uh, received his uh, MBA from LMU in 2010. And uh, his undergraduate degree in business was from University of Notre Dame. Uh, since, uh, or actually probably during and, uh, and after his MBA for, for several years, I believe uh, 17 years, Namdi has worked uh, for Sintas, is now a general, a general uh, manager of Sintas. Uh, and uh, but so I would like now to turn the time over to Namdi to talk about his experience and insights of the benefit of of uh, of that program for him. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vance. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was part of the CMS study abroad experience actually in 2011, uh, so just over a decade ago to complete my MBA at LMU. Uh, as Dr. Vance mentioned, it was a uh, it was a two semester program, so a full school year, uh, and ended with a, uh, a study abroad uh, trip. Um, so during the school year, um, our class uh, actually met, met only once a month uh, to work on our specific project. And, uh, you know, like any team that you form in a classroom uh, during those two semester, uh, we, we didn't have, we had limited exposure to one another. Uh, but then we went on our trip. And so our trip was to Asia. Um, we started by flying to Singapore. Uh, we spent a few days there. And then we went to uh, Delhi in North India, spent a few days there. Uh, then we flew south uh, to South India to Bangalore, uh, I spent some time there. And then we uh, finished the trip with a, um, by spending some time, almost a full week in Hong Kong. Um, the, in total, the trip was about three weeks long. Uh, and um, it must have been 25 to 30 uh, students. So uh, 25 to 30 young professionals. So it was a great experience. Uh, you can imagine a group of 30 um, young professionals flying around Asia uh, together, you know, occupying the same plane on the same flight, uh, on the same bus to and from uh, different places in foreign lands and uh, staying at the same hotel and, and even uh, having dinner, you know, once or twice a week uh, uh, all together. So uh, really, really uh, develop a strong bond there. Um, uh, as far as the work, this was an MBA course. So within the group, we had uh, our own teams of about six or seven students uh, that, that had been working on a specific project. Uh, we started at the beginning of the school year. Um, and uh, in those three weeks abroad, as students, we were working together on class deliverables, uh, presentations. Uh, we did a lot of benchmarking with businesses in foreign countries. And, uh, and we hung out a lot together as well. Uh, my, team, uh, my team spent 
time with executives from different companies like uh, Bain, General Motors. Um, uh, we even went to the ABC Network Studios and spent time with executives there. Uh, and, there and there was a few others. Um, and for me, um, as, a, as a young profession at the time, I was five years with my company. Uh, the trip really validated, you know, my company's training and development program. Uh, in many cases, these large companies that we were benchmarking with were doing the same things and, and had the same training programs and strategy that that we were employing. So one one of the um, one of the takeaways that I have from the trip um, was uh, the strategy that many of these companies employed uh, by hiring locals to ultimately take over and run their operations. So. Uh, now in my current role as general manager, I make an effort to hire from the local communities, um, you know, that, that we serve as. I believe that, you know, uh, folks from the community are more vested in the community. Um, and, um, you know, when, when we do that, we end up with a demographic that reflects the, uh, the marketplace. So um, hey, I want to give uh, credit to Dr. Vance. I think him and his team uh, 10 years ago uh, did a great job with the agenda. Uh, they, they always set a little bit of time that to get work done. But at every destination, we spent about half a day as an entire group uh, doing some sightseeing and tourist type stuff. Uh, I remember in North India, we took a short trip to the Taj Mahal. Uh, it's an experience I'll never forget. Um, in, in South India, we ventured out to some castle and, and, and rode elephants uh, for the day. Uh, and there was plenty of leisure time built into the, to the agenda. And uh, many times uh, folks, you know, ventured out and explored and, and traveled the area for a day. So um, really, um, really great experience, unique experience uh, for a young professional um, and, uh, you know, an opportunity to, to, again, travel foreign lands with a large number of like-minded young professionals. So uh, that, that was my experience. Um, and um, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Namdi. Uh, let's now move on to uh, uh, another person who represents uh, a, the option of of uh, study abroad, uh, actually going a full year abroad. Uh, Lisa Reed uh, was, uh, uh, who received her uh, uh, bachelor's of European studies in 2009. Um, also in uh, 2016, received her master's, or actually in th that was at LMU, that she went on to George Washington uh, uh, University in, uh, uh, in 2016, received her Master's of International Education. She has now, and so pleased, uh, is able to join us at LMU as a, a study abroad advisor. She's a program advisor in our uh, LMU study abroad office. So Lisa, I would like you to talk a bit about your example of, of, the, uh, of the full year uh, away experience. Of course, thank you, Charlie. Happy to be here today. Um, so when I came to LMU as a student, I had no idea what I wanted to major in or what I wanted to do after college, but I knew I wanted to study abroad for as long as I could. Um, so I did that, as Charlie said, I studied abroad for a full year, my whole junior year. I spent one semester in Germany with Dr. Vance and my second semester I spent in Paris. Um, it was initially I wanted to do a full year in the same place, but I'm actually really happy I had the opportunity to do two different locations because it gave kind of two different opportunities of what study abroad can be for a semester. Um, the first semester I was in Germany with Dr. Vance and other LMU students, so it was kind of a safe dive into the study abroad experience. And then my second semester, I went um, on a program that has students from all over the U.S., so it really opened up my perspective to see other students in a similar position as me, but coming from different areas all over the country. Um, and I graduated from college, had no idea still what I wanted to do, um, but I was looking around for different jobs, different opportunities, and I ended up getting hired by an American tourism organization based in Paris. And this is directly because of my study abroad experience, because when we were in Paris, we'd taken a bike tour with this company and they stuck out in my mind and it seemed like a fun thing to do right after college without knowing where else I wanted to go. Um, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made because I ended up working with this organization for two years in France and then for a couple of years in the US as well because they had tourism operations in 
DC and a few other cities. So it really opened up um, some really fun doors and opportunities for me immediately post-college. And when I started kind of taking stock and thinking of where I wanted to go next, I realized that it all came down to my study abroad experience. Everything was directly linked to going abroad, the experiences I had, the things we did. You, you think taking a bike tour might not mean anything, but it actually paved the way for a few years for me, definitely, and still to this day. So then I decided I wanted to work in study abroad because I wanted other students to be able to have the same opportunities and experiences that I have had. So I went and got my master's at the George Washington University, as Dr. Van said, and now happily I am back here at LMU. So everything has really come full circle. I now work in the study abroad office here, advising and working with students and helping them figure out where they want to go, when they want to do it, where could be the best place for them to go. Um, and it's really exciting to be on this side of things and to be able to see students in the same position I was, not really knowing what to do or where to go next, but wanting that experience. Um, so for me, what stands out from a study abroad opportunities is really just the opportunity itself. I had no idea what I wanted to do, but because of being abroad and being exposed to new things and being in these new situations, more ideas came to me than I had ever realized. And so one thing I want students to know and to be open to when you're going abroad is just to be open to what might happen. We all have our own expectations and our ideas of where we might go with our lives and what we want to do. And those are wonderful to have, but just be open when you are going abroad that something new might stick, a new opportunity might come your way. You don't want to necessarily close the door on that because it may lead to something really amazing. My life would definitely be completely different had I not studied abroad. And I can see the direct links to that. Um, the other more tangible immediate takeaways, which we always want to remind students of, as Charlie said in the beginning, um, we really, it, it's education of the whole person here at LMU. And I also very firmly believe that study abroad is definitely educating the whole person. The courses and academic work are a huge part of it, but just the personal growth that students go through when they're abroad and when we see them when they return, it is always phenomenal to see as they've matured and grown and the experiences they've had abroad, what they bring back with them. Um, and things that really stand out, especially moving on into workplace and thinking of what you're gonna do later on, the flexibility um, and the creativity that students gain when they go abroad. Uh, Charlie, you had a great example earlier of the technical difficulties we were happening and you just have to fly with it. And that's what we tell students all the time because that really is when you're abroad, you miss the train, the museum you wanted to go to was closed. These things just happen. And so on a daily life, you practice these skills of flexibility and dealing with ambiguity that um, end up being really useful later on in a variety of whatever fields you may want to go into. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lisa. That's really, really helpful. Um, yeah, I just totally want uh, uh, to, to emphasize again how critical having the international experience is. Uh, a lot of my research is uh, that a lot of researchers find that to develop a global mindset, a kind of a cosmopolitan perspective is very hard to do within a classroom within your own country. And uh, just, uh, I've had students uh, in other country. I remember one, I was working with uh, uh, two of our students in China in Guangzhou, China, and uh, another one from other, another university. And one of the students said, I've learned more in this past month here in China than the whole past year at my, my other university. So the, the intensity and the power is just incredible for uh, having these this international learning experience uh, that no other kind of uh, learning in, in your own country in the classroom uh, can provide. Uh, I'd like now to go on to uh, an, another alum, Dylan Joyce, uh, who uh, received uh, his Bachelor's of Business in 2009 at LMU. Uh, I met, uh, I believe, a few years earlier in a similar course as I had with Justin Allen. Uh, uh, in this course, I gave them several assignments and, and this was pre-COVID, of course, and a lot of this was delivered on a distance basis, but I'd also go there for a week with uh, to Germany to visit with the students and uh, 
give an exam and do a lot of uh, site tours and things, just wonderful. I remember talking to Dylan, uh, who was having a great experience in Bonn, Germany, in the traditional semester study abroad experience. And I mentioned to him that I have a, a great connection in China. I had recently finished a Fulbright experience uh, in uh, the first half of 2006 in, in China. And uh, I had a, a connection in Xi'an, basically the, where the civilization started in China, uh, uh, the, the home of the terracotta warriors. So, um, but, and I have th had this connection. I mentioned it to Dylan and he was just, his ears just, uh, uh, just popped up. He was so interested and we were able to work out for him an international internship that next summer after his his study abroad in, in Germany. So uh, I'd like to turn the time now over to Dylan to talk uh, whatever else he wants to talk about his Germany experience, but also the model or the example of an, it, what an international internship can bring. So go ahead, Dylan. Dr. Vance. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am Dylan Joyce. Uh, just a brief introduction about me, some of which Dr. Vance has said already. Um, so I graduated with my bachelor's in business in 09, did my uh, semester, my spring semester, junior year in Germany, and then immediately following that, the summer semester internship and course in Xi'an, China. So my journey since then has been varied. I've been a teacher, a songwriter, a frontman, a product manager. I grabbed my MBA at Cornell Tech and just graduated. Now I'm a strategic business consultant. And so what I'd like to talk about briefly today is my experiences in Germany and then especially China, the benefits of those experiences, what they've been for me and what they could be for you. And finally, some basic recommendations about how you might pursue your own experiences abroad. So uh, to begin with my experience in Germany, uh, I lived with a host family, highly recommend that you do that. There's no replacement for immersion. There is no replacement for immersion. And so that helps a lot with the language and the cultural uh, sort of education there. The curriculum was tailored for the German experience. So there's German philosophers, intercultural communication negotiations, uh, specifically for Germany and even a German themed cryptography class. Experience the local culture, so that was beer halls and castles and clubs and carnival, all a lot of fun. Um, when I was in Germany, as Dr. Vance said, Dr. Vance had actually presented in one of our classes, and he mentioned to the class that he had placed uh, or he had a relationship and a way of getting students into China. And as he said, I immediately perked up. I asked him after class if he could do the same for me. And within, I think it was only a few weeks, we had set a plan. I was in correspondence with a man who would be my boss and my host there. And so I think an interesting point is that when I told my classmates this, they were shocked. Uh, how did I pull this off? How in a, you know, a program of ambitious students, uh, business students, how did I get the internship of the world's most important rising economic power? And the truth was that everybody was in the room and everybody heard the same thing, but simply by paying attention and taking a small amount of initiative and making myself open to the generosity of Dr. Vance, uh, I was able to basically be the one that, that got this opportunity simply by being the one to ask I received. So cut forward to a couple months later, landed in Beijing, then went to Xi'an. It was utterly unlike anything I had ever experienced. Uh, I felt like I'd landed on the moon, the <laughs> language, the food, the social norms, everything seemed different, if not completely opposite. Uh, I stuck out entirely, as you might imagine. When I went to the zoo, the other visitors pointed it at me. So the fish out of water was a very challenging experience, but ultimately that's what made the experience valuable. So I was working as an assistant to the president. I was generating refining business plans. I gave presentations to his staff on American culture. I was attending meetings with him and networking with his contacts. I saw how business was done and specifically how business was done in China. So I saw how he, a master networker, built coalitions and pitched ideas to new business partners and all important political connections. I saw how he managed people. I saw how he balanced those competing priorities and how he determined when to redirect his efforts and when to double down. So it was incredibly educational in a way that, as others have said, simply could not be recreated in the classroom. It was real world experience in a completely different environment. So the benefits to these are, I would say, in two categories, the career advantages and the sort of personal and developmental advantages. The career advantages, frankly, I think are less important, but I'll cover them because you're probably uh, at least somewhat motivated by those. Obviously, it looks good on a resume. 
for a number of reasons. First off, it's just not something that a lot of people can say, especially if you are in an environment that's especially dissimilar from your regular one. It demonstrates an ability to function in higher ambiguity environments and function well. Uh, it obviously gives you familiarity with other cultures and languages that can get you staffed on other projects. It can even open up the door for you to work in a foreign country after graduation if that's something that you're looking for. So those are all important and real career and professional advantages. But I think the more important thing is the personal and the developmental aspect of it. It truly does expand your mind. It allows you to prove yourself to yourself. And finally, it really helps to develop relationships in a way that you basically can't do in any other situation. So with the aspect of expanding your mind, I would just say that you're learning about new people and the new location. So you're going to learn to appreciate both these similarities and the differences. And there are very much both of those. So when you touch down and everyone is speaking a different language and you know the air tastes different and people are wearing, wearing different clothes and all of that, you're going to feel overwhelmed and completely out of place. And you might believe in this environment and these people are fundamentally and totally different from you. And then you stay a little longer and realize that actually deep down everyone's the same, that we all love our families and we have ambitions and disappointments and we get happy and sad and everything else. And finally, you stay long enough to realize that both of those things are true, that there are common and important features that unite us all and there are, com or there are unique features that distinguish us. And ultimately, the growth is going to come from embracing both of those things. And so in doing so, you're not just going to learn about their environment, you're going to learn about your own, and you're not just going to learn about others, but you're going to learn about yourself. So specifically in China, you can say that China's cultural roots are in Confucianism, which very much establishes a lot of differences and almost dichotomies between China and the U.S. So China is more collectivist, typically America is more individualist. China is, tends to be more hierarchical. America tends to be a lot less deferential to hierarchy. And where Chinese communication is often indirect and suffused with implicit meeting, Americans are often direct and implicit, and we tend to just sort of speak up uh, loudly. And so there are a thousand other contrasts. And looking back, I took a lot about my perspective, my way of life for granted before I went on that trip. But by being confronted with completely different perspectives and ways of life on a daily basis, my understanding broadened on how societies and people could be. And so I was able to see the strengths and the weaknesses of both. And I tried to incorporate the best of each into the way that I looked at the world and the way that I behaved. Uh, and so briefly, secondly, with these experiences, I proved to myself that I could function in an extremely different environment, that I sort of have what it takes. And so starting a new job or a new educational program is much less difficult when you've already done both of those things in a completely foreign environment. And finally, relationships, people bond in times of adversity. And so in the same way that immersion accelerates learning, it also accelerates the development of relationships. So I saw that in Germany, I made friends very quickly. We discovered new places together, we went into unfamiliar situations. We learned about each other in those situations and learned that we could trust each other. And those bonds last. I still keep in touch with some of those people today. In China, I was taken in by my boss's family. I was given a Chinese name. I was introduced to their close friends. They were extraordinarily hospitable. And since then, I've actually met with them on trips to the US and even advised her daughter on where to stay when she attended grad school in the United States. So the relationships, the things that you learn about yourself and the things that you learn about others are all incredibly rewarding and really can't be gotten in the same way in, in any other strategy or in any other environment. And so my basic recommendations, if you would choose to do something like this, is first pick the experience that's right for you. So that could be a couple of weeks, that could be a semester, that could be the full two semesters or a year program, whatever is comfortable for you. And it could be that you sort of, as Lisa was saying, you sort of jump in with a sort of a more moderate experience and then decide that you're ready for something more pushing your boundaries, I suppose. And so I would recommend that you ultimately do try to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. You're young. This is the time to take risks and grow. LMU is ultimately going to make sure that you are okay, but you should be basically putting yourself in new situations where you're not necessarily sure what's going to happen or how you're going to deal or how you're going to grow, but that's how you get better. And finally, if you go, I would set a few intentions for the trip, places to visit, a level of uh, like linguistic or cultural uh, fluency, and just setting some milestones and maybe even grabbing a buddy on the trip and sort of helping keep each other accountable. And so I would close by saying, Again, this is an incredibly rare experience, 
Uh, you're very much in good hands with Dr. Vance and the rest of the team. They're very trustworthy and experienced. They will put you in situations where you're both safe and also challenged. So I would highly recommend if you're at all on the fence here, go. It's a rare opportunity after graduation, a like one may not come by again soon. And there's no better environment to bond and no better education than travel. So please go and uh, have to answer some questions later on. Thank you. Ray, that's terrific, Dylan. Th uh, thanks so much on that. Uh, but uh, I also realize that uh, Dylan's experience represents uh, often what we can see where someone does a study abroad experience in more a traditional like a semester abroad, but then uh, develops a greater kind of interest in a, in a more intense experience in an international internship. Uh, often it, the internship may be in the, the same country. In Dylan's case, it's, uh, it's in a whole different part of the world. But we often see an initial semester abroad followed by a more immersive international internship experience that are uh, both very, very valuable. Uh, we have another casualty, uh, 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 Jay, Jacob Coronel, uh, who had received his master's in education at LMU in 2016, uh, is, is not feeling well. Um, but, uh, but I wanted just to introduce him because from his experience of a, a student Fulbrighter, the Fulbright program is a great national uh, development program for uh, uh, scholars and for students. Uh, we are now uh, sharing a uh, information about uh, uh, some past uh, alums who have been involved in the uh, Fulbright uh, program. So on, on November 18th, as part of our International or, inter or International Education Week, it looks like uh, November 18th, uh, 11 a.m., uh, uh, there's going to be a Zoom session about uh, uh, the Fulbright program and how students can uh, become or uh, look into and look at opportunities to go abroad as part of an ed international education through the Fulbright uh, program. So uh, I definitely uh, encourage anyone who's interested in the Fulbright program. Uh, it's, it's a scholarship uh, that to go and um, in the program that Jacob Coronel was, was in was in Mexico where he taught uh, English as part of his Fulbright uh, uh, program. He's since now become uh, uh, teaching English in Pico Rivera in Southern California. Uh, but just wanted to use that, the Fulbright program, through our international office to encourage students who are interested to look into that as a form of, of international education. Now, I'd like uh, to, we have one more. Uh, this is not exactly an alum. Gina Tesla, who went to Pace University and uh, later got her MBA uh, at Cornell, uh, I would like to, with the power vested in me, make you an honorary alum for the uh, balance of our webinar, at least. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Gina, before uh, uh, her uh, initial uh, connection with us was to present kind of a corporate perspective, what employers think about people who have had these pre-career international experiences. When I looked at her background, I saw that she uh, had uh, two years involvement in, in Panama uh, with the Peace Corps. And this is another extremely valuable kind of international education. We also have, uh, there are many different, like you can go on to uh, Google vol volunteer service abroad or whatever you see many programs. We have a Jesuit volunteers programs in other countries where students can become involved. Um, but uh, Gina, I'd like you just, uh, before we get into the, the corporate perspective, if you could share with us um, your, your, the nature of the, the Peace Corps experience that you had several years ago. Dr. Vance, thanks so much for inviting me to this webinar. It's just been fantastic to listen to, and there are so many common threads, I would say, both as a Peace Corps volunteer and as an employer, as I'll talk about later. My Peace Corps service will always be a gift to me. It's a lifelong gift that has planted seeds in me that continue to grow, even though it's been quite a while since I was um, at my Peace, since I was serving at my Peace Corps site. Um, 
And I have to say that the experience was completely invaluable in the sense of really, I mean, talk about taking me out of my comfort zone. I went into Peace Corps service at a slightly different time than most people. People tend to go maybe right out of undergrad or maybe they'll go later in life. I went after I had established a career and I really felt a call to service. And <laughs> what an opportunity. I went from at the time living in San Francisco, having all of the conveniences around me to going to the Peace Corps where I had to learn everything over again, everything from how to communicate. I had the distinct honor of living with an indigenous group of people called the Kunas who have maintained their lifestyle over the last 500 years. They still maintain their language and I had to learn their language off of Spanish, which I was not fluent in. So I was learning two languages at once. I had to learn how to communicate. I had to learn how to survive. I was living um, on an island. We didn't have any electricity or run, running water. So everything was completely new to me from the climate to the language, to the culture, to how I had to wash my clothes and what I was gonna eat. And that experience really gave me this lifelong lesson in terms of flexibility and adaptability and mostly it would package it all in terms of emotional intelligence. And to have the opportunity to learn from failure. So I made mistakes. As much as I tried, there were things, I had cultural missteps um, and I had to learn from them. And I had to explain myself in a third language that I was learning within a completely different cultural context. That gave me the tenacity and strength to know that if I could succeed in that type of environment, I could succeed anywhere. And I say that it's a gift because it's not anyone experienced that kind of close, you know, where I closed the book and said, well, this is something that I did and that was a chapter in my life. Every day I have the opportunity to apply the lessons that I learned from Peace Corps specifically listening. It is so important to just stop and listen to people and to take the time and people really appreciate it. You can't assume that you know where somebody else is coming from and it really gave me that firsthand experience which has benefited me tremendously throughout my life and throughout my career. It's helped me in terms of leading global teams my most recent position at Microsoft, I was leading global teams and managing people from all over the globe. And the only way that I could do that successfully was by listening. So I'm so grateful for, for learning that from the Peace Corps. I talked about flexibility and, agi and agility. Every day, I didn't know exactly what I was going to be doing. And I had, you know, the best laid plans of what I might be teaching that day in terms of, I was teaching English like many Peace Corps volunteers do, but I was really there for community economic development. So I was working very closely with the community in terms of how they could support their tourism activities. And I might've said to myself, okay, today I'm gonna go through X, Y, Z lessons, or I'm hoping to accomplish this certain thing. But like many Peace Corps volunteers, if you woke up and it happened to be raining, then maybe nobody would show up to the meeting or maybe there would be something happening in the community or the people that you were working with um, decided to go out fishing for the day for some important reason. And so it just really taught me that I had to be flexible and I had to be adaptable because otherwise, I would have just been completely frustrated all the time. And I'm not going to claim that I, you know, this came through experience. So I had plenty of frustrations, but that moment in which I heard another person, in this case, I was working with a women's cooperative and I heard, you know, one woman, one woman detailing one of the lessons that I had been trying to impart to the other. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, 
it actually, it actually was worth something. And that elation that I felt was worth all of the frustration that I had from, from this kind of service. Um, so listening, being flexible, being adaptable, and also to me, I mean, fundamentally what it taught me was I learned so much more from the people who I served um, than I think that I, I ever imparted to them. So it just gave me just a whole nother level of gratitude, made me quite humble going from a position where, as I said before, I thought that, you know, I had achieved a lot in my career and I was living in San Francisco and having a great life. And here I went from that to not even knowing really truly how I could feed myself, get my water, do my laundry and talk to people and survive the very different climate. And so that taught me just a deep sense of humility, which, and gratitude, you know, such gratitude for the opportunities that I've been given. Um, and so, you know, I think that those are the types of building blocks and life lessons that are very helpful in terms of whether it was when I continued my studies. Um, so after Peace Corps, going to Cornell, working with, um, you know, international uh, teammates. As a parent, it's helped me. And certainly it's helped me both as an employee and as an employer. I would encourage anybody who has the opportunity to serve um, and to, to study internationally, you will be giving yourself a gift that will pay dividends for many, many years. There's so much more I could say, Dr. Vance, about Peace Corps, but I believe you want to move on yeah, to the panel. And actually, I, I didn't mention earlier, but uh, I, I believe all the panelists are open if any, anyone is interested in following up specific questions that uh, if you send me uh, the, your email, I can pass on to, uh, to any of the panelists uh, for further uh, uh, connections. What uh, I would like to uh, now, uh, and thank you so much for that, Gina, uh, what we have seen here is that under the umbrella of study abroad, there are many different kinds of experiences people can have uh, after a, like a semester study or a full year study, a two or three week international business or international uh, study tour. Could be a semester abroad, a full year abroad, an international internship, uh, a Fulbright kind of uh, an appointment somewhere, or uh, uh, a volunteer humanitarian service type of thing. So lots of different kinds of uh, uh, international learning experience before one's career that can be an incredible uh, benefit. What I would like now to kind of open it up to all the panelists, as well as to open up other uh, of the, the attendees or participants who would like to ask questions. One that I see and, and would like to, uh, the panelists to comment on, that uh, he, it looks like a huge part of, and common part of this international experience is the, the self-discovery and the kind of the, the increased self-awareness that the international experience uh, provides. Uh, can any of you uh, comment on that or is that, definitely a commonality. I'm happy to jump in. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, th I think self-discovery is, is huge because you know yourself in environments where you're safe at home or in college and then all of a sudden you're thrown into a completely new environment. Most of the kind of norms and rules that we're used to do not apply. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting kind of seeing what, what happens. I think we would always, I, we would identify in our study abroad groups, the person who would all of a sudden kind of take the lead and then everyone kind of falls into place. The group dynamics become very interesting, but, um, sometimes it's just you and it's just you at the train station having to figure out where your train is when you can't read the language of where things are. So all of a sudden you're thrust into situations where even if you're not comfortable, you have to take that step because you have to advocate for yourself and what you wanna do that day, um, how big or small that may be. Um, and I think having that 
recurring on a daily basis. It's not as exhausting as it sounds. It definitely can be, but it's just, it's reiterated and reiterated every single day. And so the growth through adversity, as Dylan was saying before, is is huge and you come home much more confident and much more capable. At least that's how I felt before before I went abroad. Right. Anyone else commenting on that idea of the self-awareness increase? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I mean, that was one of the biggest things and and particularly, I mean, to just have a different sense of what it meant to be American, both to myself and to everybody else and the assumptions that people made um, because we were American. I mean, part of Peace Corps' mission um, to, sp to spread, you know, peace and love and friendship is also, you know, there's there, part of the mission is really to be showing the diversity among Americans, right? Uh, long before anybody started talking about diversity, but for to really show up and say, you know, we're not at the, t at the time dating myself. So I was in the Peace Corps from 2000 to 2002. Um, you're, you know, we're not just what you see on TV. So for example, you know, wherever you go, <laughs> almost every corner of this, of this earth, somebody will have a TV powered somehow by battery or in some way. And that many people had sort of an impression of what Americans were like through TV. Now it would be different. But part of what we were doing was really showing up and saying, you know, we represent all different kinds of people. So I would say absolutely from a self-awareness perspective, it really helped me see how Americans can show up in the world. And that's really to this day, really, I've tried to be uh, empathetic to how we show up in the world and why we may have certain criticisms, why people might like certain things about us and not. And I think that that's a very valuable experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Namdi or Dylan, any, anything else that, that you want to add? Sure, just briefly. And I think I started to talk about this, but there were dimensions that I didn't even realize were dimensions because they had just always been that way. For example, like the idea that the most powerful person in the room would be the person talking the most is basically often opposite uh, in China, right? Like the, the power is so much more, I am listening and there's more power in understanding than immediately being understood. And there's just a million things where if you weren't exposed to another version of it, you wouldn't even think that the decision could be made the other way. You wouldn't even recognize that it was a decision. You would just think, well, this is how it is. Yeah, there's sort of a, uh, a this is water, if you've heard that aspect to it, where fish is just swimming around and one fish comes up to two others and says, you know, hey, the water's great for the day. And then the other fish swim for a little while. And then one fish turns to the other and says, what's water, right? <laughs> and so it's just sort of the thing that is always around you. And if you are not, if you don't go to sort of other waters, then you just think, well, it, it must be like this. But in fact, no, there are completely different ways of thinking. There are completely different sets of values. There's different ways that people meet the same needs. And without actually experiencing that, like, you know, in an abstract way that that is true, but without actually experiencing it and living it every day, it's very hard to fully appreciate that and then to even sort of start to incorporate that knowledge into mm -hmm. how you look at the world and how you live. So, yeah. Great. Uh, what something that Namdi mentioned earlier that, uh, that he took a, a, a big lesson from was the development of local leadership, which is kind of the focus of our, least, uh, of our research and, and how that, uh, Namdi, you've really tried to make that an emphasis in your current work um, as well as you're talking about all the teamwork kind of stuff. And it just really struck me how, how you have, and the rest of you have commented, how the international experience has, has stuck with you in terms of your current work, your current thinking. Uh, for me, uh, the many different international experiences I have, I've had uh, live with me constantly and are a, a tremendous blessing. Um, so in, in your careers, you, you clearly see the impact that is still living with you of your international experiences. See a lot of good nods, yes. So <laughs> I, 
uh, I guess that's a, a clear yes, but any any particular comment on that in terms of the uh, the current applications uh, that are being uh, used in your your careers? Yeah, Dr. Vance, I think I, I mentioned uh, a couple of things, um, but you know, generally speaking, and, and my experience was was uh, was not immersive, right? It was more of a a shotgun trip, um, and uh, we moved around a lot. Um, certainly uh, developed a lot of relationships with uh, the the students uh, that travel with us, the the uh, the staff on on your team. But um, you know, I think um, it going into different businesses, which was our focus, um, certainly um, you know gave some affirmation uh, to the way uh, you know I've gone about things, uh, and and also you know. Um, I think uh, uh, help me look at things from a different lens, right? Uh, hey, maybe we can change some things and how we and uh, our approach. Um, you know, listening was something that was was uh, brought up a ton, and and that was really uh, the critical piece of our research was just to you know get get in front of uh, of these folks and, and listen. And so, um, hey, that's a, I think a valuable tool with uh, just dealing with people. Um, you know, Dylan mentioned the commonality that we all have with people. Um, and uh, if, if we listen, you know, um, we will, um, you know, I, I think that we, we can find that connection um, and, um, you know, and, and, and move forward. So, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of different um, travel experience. I love to travel, um, but uh, I haven't had an immersive uh, experience um, like, like some of the other folks. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's a lot of value in and um, you know, watching the way things go about, and and, and really looking at the commonalities and taking away uh, the things that the, the approaches that work that that you know both cultures do. Well, I, I wish we could study about or comment about this or focus on uh, the pre-career international experience and how it has benefited you in your lives and the connections you've made, the networking, new ideas, new directions is provided. But the reality is we, uh, we don't have all, all night. And uh, we have another important part of our program is the corporate perspective. Uh, uh, we, uh, as students, are, uh, find these kinds of experiences valuable. But the a, a question is, do organizations value people who have had these experiences? I've heard sometimes that people look at a, a junior year fall semester abroad as as uh, a lark experience, and it's just you know something that uh, is uh, is it's really more of a of just time for fun uh, rather than the development experience it is. I also had a colleague who uh, actually teaches our students in Germany, and he uh, before starting his career, he had an opportunity to do a one year. Uh, service, uh, volunteer service experience in Ireland. Uh, and a lot of his friends were saying, you do this, you're going to be a year behind in your career. Uh, when he returned, he found that employers totally valued, not only because of the humanitarian service and what all that re represents, but there were key skills that he was uh, gaining as a result, result of that volunteer service, uh, which is, again, a, an ex, a forum or a kind of example of study abroad. So I'd like now to uh, turn some time over to uh, Gina to talk more from the, uh, Gina, not only at Microsoft and now uh, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, consulting. Uh, with uh, Coupa. Coupa, that's right, in Seattle. Uh, has also worked with, uh, with IBM. So has a lot of grounding in kind of the corporate view. So let me just start with a question to get you going. Do, do companies look at, at these experiences as a waste of time and uh, uh, that uh, just an indulgence? Absolutely not. This kind of experience is completely invaluable and I think is absolutely complementary to what you learn in the classroom, but to have the type of experience that we've all been talking about, you know, is I've been talking about my Peace Corps experience. If you have a few hundred volunteers in, in one particular country, 
every single one of those volunteers is going to have a different experience, just like everybody here um, today has had a different experience. And what that means is that it creates this enormous amount of personal growth um, within each of us. And as employers, it's everything that I just mentioned. You know, the overall umbrella, I would say, is emotional intelligence. Knowing that somebody has taken the time out of their lives to put themselves out there and be vulnerable in these types of experiences is completely invaluable to a corporation because there are some things that you can teach people and there are other things that people learn through experiences. And emotional intelligence is something that you can really augment through these types of experiences. What do I mean by that? It's everything that we've been talking about in terms of the importance of listening, knowing that we are working in a very much globally integrated world and that to be successful in a corporation, you really need to be able to work with all different kinds of people, whether that's people who, who are in your sitting next to you now that would be remotely or if you happen to be in, in person but what i'm talking about is people who come from all different kinds of walks of life whether you're working on a global team or whether you're working within your own geographic area being able to thrive and succeed working with people who on the face of it might be different from you or might bring different perspectives we know that um, companies that have more diverse talent boards that have more diverse representation are more successful. So when I'm looking at a candidate and looking at this type of experience, absolutely, I would actually be putting a, a weight on that in terms of saying that this was a very valuable experience because this person, more likely than not, has had this ability to really sharpen their emotional intelligence, listening, flexibility, adaptability, empathy, being able to work in diverse teams, being able to work on global teams. It's all of that, um, you know, I talked, to, I touched on this very briefly, but knowing what it's like to be vulnerable and to put yourself in a situation where inevitably you're going to fail on some level. You're going to, to Lisa's point, I mean, you might be looking at this subway map and be thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea where I'm going or, you know, and depending on what kind of um, environment that you're in, the bus just might never come because the driver didn't feel like coming that day. You know, you got to learn how to be flexible with those types of things. And I would say that as an employer who I've hired many, many people um, over time, and I would say that it's definitely something that I would, that I do appreciate. And then as a member of Global Team, as a manager of Global Teams, it's absolutely essential because it's very challenging when you're when you're part of a global team, when you're managing people who are sitting on the other side of the world. You know, you're inevitably talking to people when if you're trying to have a global meeting, particularly here in the Pacific time zone, some but it's for half of the attendees, it's a time when you should be sleeping. So you kind of have some of these challenges that are putting you in a difficult position to begin with, and you want to be able to draw upon some strengths that you have developed. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about is a very specific program that we created at IBM, which is called the Corporate Service Corps, and it's a corporate version of the Peace Corps. And I had the pleasure of leading the program for eight years. The idea behind the program is that employees who were high-performing employees would apply to join this program. They would go through three months of intense pre-work and then come together in teams of about 15 people from all over the world. So 15 people from IBM who were coming from all different disciplines, all different generations, all different countries and experiences. And the point was for them to be immersed on an assignment that would be very strategic, that would be challenging, where they would be able to contribute their skills and capabilities as individuals and together as a team. We sent over the course of the life of the Corporate Service Corps that I was leading the program, we sent over 4,000 employees who came from 60 countries around the world to 40 countries around the world and worked on 1,500 projects spanning issues from health, education, gender diversity, um, 
building community resiliency and many other types of initiatives. And what we learned from this program, and we started off thinking, okay, maybe we'll send a couple of hundred people and let's just, let's see how this experiment goes to where under my tenure, we had, you know, had had 4,000 people who went through the program. And the reason why it was so large and why IBM invested in this program was because it worked, because it gave people an experience where they had to go into a very ambiguous situation as much as we gave them the pre-work, as much as we explained what the situation would be, they had to fly from somewhere, some corner of the globe to another part where they were meeting up with 14 of their colleagues who they never met in person and had a very relatively short period of time to solve a very significant challenge and to do that in an environment that was completely foreign to them. And IBM invested in this type of program because we really saw the, the benefits. We saw how it improved employee engagement, leadership development. We were able to make significant contributions to the community and it brought visibility to IBM and it helped us open up new markets and do many, many other things. But keeping it sort of focused on the topic at hand, we invested in this type of program because we really saw the benefit of people being in a challenging situation with colleagues from around the world. And it's a great example of how people had the opportunity to both serve and to learn. And while people, you know, I never set the expectation that it was gonna change people's lives, they would come back and say that it had significantly changed their eyes, had opened them up to a whole new world. And yes, it was what they had expected in terms of, let's say, going to a country Turkey, that they had never been, a continent they had never set foot on. They'd never had four weeks to immerse themselves in, in, in a service-based assignment. All of those things were true, but what they came back really completely, completely lit up about was the benefits of working within that global team and how they learned so much about their colleagues and how they had these lifelong um, friends and connections around the company. And ultimately we expanded it where we brought other companies in or we brought other nonprofit organizations to come and work together with us. So I would say that it's a great example of how companies absolutely see this type of experience as invaluable, as I said earlier, and I would definitely look at a candidate who had this type of experience and, you know, and when you're looking, when you're, when you're hiring, you're looking at all different kinds of candidates and anything that can set you apart, I think also makes it more interesting. The interviewer will be looking forward to talking with you and hearing some of your stories. So I would absolutely encourage everybody to consider it. Oh, your microphone. No, no, there we go. What, uh, especially in, in hearing about the stories and, and seeing how those experiences can translate into their new, their new performance or new capabilities. And, uh, so, uh, they're great stories and what's essential for, uh, for all of us is to see how we can translate and make it, uh, have a positive impact on our current, uh, current work and, and activities. Uh, so uh, it sounds like a big yes that employers definitely value uh, uh, students that have had past international uh, experience and uh, and are able to see how it can enhance their 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 company activity. Yeah, definitely. What what I really like your example with IBM is how they use that in kind of uh, developing a what we call this is a corporate culture where they're developing relationships all around the world of IBM employees that despite uh, deep cultural differences, they develop common bonds, common values of the company that uh, transcend the national cultures into kind of a corporate culture, corporate identity. That's right. And the program was so successful that we would have our clients coming to us and saying, how do we create this type of program? And we were very open um, with all of our intellectual capital in terms of the program design, 
A couple of things I'll talk about is one, we worked with USAID and an NGO to offer basically a playbook in terms of how companies could engage in this type of activity. The State Department hosted the celebration of our five-year anniversary because we worked very closely with the State Department. As I said, we were working in 40 different countries around the world. And when you think about citizen diplomacy, this was a great way for us to embark in citizen diplomacy and to work with organizations that the State Department was also um, supporting. So it was terrific for us in terms of connections to the, to, um, to the public sector for us as a company. And then our clients would come to us and say, how do you do this? And we would say, why don't you come along? And we had many different clients who would come and join us. And to your point, it became, you know, hey, you're not, you're JP Morgan and you're Johnson and Johnson. No, it was you're Lisa and you're Dylan and we're all working together. And people became, you know, the sort of the labels came off because people were really focused on the particular issue that they were working on. There are many companies who have created their own version of the corporate service course. So Pepsi has their own version, Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan Chase, many companies. So I would also encourage people when you're looking at companies um, to see what kinds of opportunities they provide for this type of service. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we have some questions from uh, our participants. Uh, let, let's get into these. Uh, one. Uh, this is probably a, one, a good one to be addressed to Lisa, who knows uh, a lot of our different programs. Um, this question, basically, uh, students that have kind of a functional focus, like marketing or engineering or something, uh, versus other students that are just very broad, like international business or international relations. Are there uh, study abroad programs that may uh, be, be su more suited for people with a functional focus like engineering or film and television or something like that? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so at LMU specifically, we do have some programs that are geared towards functional majors. We have a study abroad program for engineers, um, and we have a couple different ones in film as, as well as other areas. But I think the key to take away here is that study abroad is for all majors. Um, you can find something anywhere, um, and sometimes it's even outside of the classroom. I'm thinking of something we remarked upon when we were studying abroad in Germany, um, and I wasn't even a marketing student, but you could just tell, you look around and you see the marketing that is present in Germany, and we noticed the differences. People were not in the photos and whatever ads there were on buses or in magazines, you know, people weren't as photoshopped as much. People looked a little more normal. They looked very different than what we would see um, in ads and campaigns in the US. So briefly to say it's for everyone um, and you don't necessarily need to have a major focused program in order to get something out of study abroad because at the end of the day, you are taking classes, but really it's the personal growth and development and that can happen regardless of what you're studying in the classroom. And I like to liken it to it's kind of you get out of study abroad what you put into it, um, kind of like college. Like, can you just show up a class, not ask any questions and leave? Absolutely. But you can also show up to class, take notes, participate in the discussion, do the extra credit opportunity at the end of the day. Um, so it's up to you how much you want to get out of your study abroad experience. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let's see, I have an, another question. Uh, this is for Dylan. Uh, the question is, how was living with a host family? How long would you say it took to get comfortable and you and used to living in a home abroad? Yeah, so I think that the answer is different uh, depending on Germany and China. So in Germany, I was actually living with a host family. Uh, I recommend it extremely, like it, I would almost, I don't want to say this, but I would almost say don't go if you're not going to live with a host family. Like that's too extreme, but it is so essential to the experience to do that. Uh, otherwise, you're kind of just going back to home base all the time and you are living amongst your peers, which is, you know, good and comfortable, but it's not engaging with which I, what I think is sort of an essential challenge to the experience. 
um, which is speaking the language and just sort of soaking up the culture and just doing something that is truly different. So for me, I would say that it's absolutely essential. In terms of how long uh, it took me to get comfortable, I don't know. I would say that probably roughly a few weeks in, I was fairly comfortable. And by about a month or so, I was basically completely comfortable um, in Germany. In China, it was different because I was actually living uh, in like sort of off of the main offices. So it's actually like a very <laughs> unique experience. Um, but I think in some ways I was pretty comfortable there to begin with, both because I had just come out of a, uh, a broad experience and also because while I was sort of very close to the office, it was sort of my own space. So I could always just go back there. Um, so, oh, sorry. I meant how, I oh, was sorry. This is a follow-up question to, uh, to the other. So yeah, in general, I would just say, I very much enjoyed living with the host family. There were times when it was more challenging than just going back to, you know, my own place or going back to, um, you know, a bunch of people that are from the same place that I was from, but ultimately it was extremely rewarding and I would highly, highly recommend it. So, yeah. Okay. And Lisa, did you live with a, a German family or, or a, a French family? I did. I lived with both. I had a homestay in both of my semester abroad experiences. Um, and I would say, yeah, I think initially it can, can be really uncomfortable. You're living in a stranger's home who you've never met before. <laughs> that is definitely going out of your comfort zone. Um, but the key to remember is that they want you there. They've volunteered to have a student stay with them um, and they want to participate in that experience. Um, and, and again, you kind of find your, your own way. Every relationship can be a little different, um, but you really have to put in the effort to get to know them. Um, I think especially because in, in my experience staying in European families, they are far more reserved than we are as Americans. We're very outgoing and it's very easy for us to be friendly and chit chat and hello, how's it going? And it's gonna take a little more digging um, to get to know someone in Europe on a like longer term, deeper basis, but completely worth it. Um, my French host family and I are very close. We've stayed in touch for over 10 years now. Um, and that's been a wonderful gift that's come out of the experience that I never would have anticipated. All right, another question that uh, is kind of relates to the inevitable culture shock. I don't know how much Namdi had in, he was in pretty much the whole time in what we call the tourist or honeymoon phase in the three weeks of our wonderful visits to these different countries. Uh, but the rest of you that were in a country for a much longer, what kinds of things did you do or what resources did you use to get through the kind of the 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 low the low times the uncomfortable low moments of your inevitable culture shock adjustment period yeah i would say i had extreme culture shock and it's um insidious in a way it's kind of i mean you know what's happening but you kind of don't like like you know, for me, I was living with my host family in the Peace Corps, the, the model that I was a part of. Um, we spent three months with our host family. And when I first arrived, you know, it was definitely, definitely culture shock. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Everything is so completely different and I can't do this. And, um, just really upset about things. And that was like the most intense. And then um, the way that I got through that particular moment was, you know, it was, and this was, as I said before, this was right on the cusp of, um, you know, nobody had smartphones. Um, I didn't have any sort of regular access to talking to friends or family, um, but I was able to, um, to talk to my father who really encouraged me to stick it out. And it was, that was something that, I mean, I'll carry for me forever, right? It was just a moment that I was able to have with my dad who was really supportive of me, who initially, I mean, both my parents thought I was nuts. <laughs> so to have, you know, the support when I really needed it was helpful. And then I would say it was very much throughout the two years, it was very much a roller coaster where, especially in that first year, where there were very, you know, there were moments where, um, you know, there were just different degrees of 
culture shock. And for me, it was either, you know, there were other Peace Corps volunteers in country who we could meet, you know, we met up with from time to time for training or to run sessions together. And certainly that was supportive. Um, you know, just having a laugh. I mean, I was living with people, like I was saying before, there were some um, women who didn't speak any Spanish and I was just learning the indig indigenous language. I could barely, barely communicate with them. But we would end up laughing about all kinds of silly things. And so that's like part of what I learned was you may think on the face of it, oh, we're so different, but really, truly, we're all so similar. And, um, you know, in the face of it, I looked, they, they literally thought I was an alien who came out of the sky. <laughs> but what we learned was that we had so much in common. And so I think it was just sort of those little moments, sharing a laugh, um, reading a letter that I had received from home, uh, having, you know, like my favorite candy that somebody would have sent me and just kind of, you know, what a gift, right? I mean, if I still to this day, I think it's a constant, um, I'm a constant project of continuous improvement. And, and the more that you can appreciate just the little things in life that bring you joy, the happier that you'll be. All right. Uh, we're really uh, running out of, of time now. I would love to hear uh, from uh, Dylan. Basically, I loved his comment that when he went to the zoo, uh, the kids would, would be watching him instead of the animals. And <laughs> uh, that was my experience uh, when I was in China as well. But uh, uh, there was a, a quick question about uh, credits. Definitely, uh, you can get credits and study abroad and have them transfer. But check with Lisa in our study abroad office on that. Let me now turn the time back over to Dr. Peck. And uh, th thanks, everyone, for your wonderful part of our program today. OK, thanks so much, Charlie, uh, for moderating such an interesting and intriguing panel discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I wish we had more time for Q&A session. And I also would like to thank Gina, Lisa, Dylan, and Namdi for sharing your precious experiences and insights with us about this very timely and important topic today. Uh, Gina, you talk about building emotional intelligence several times that would help develop flexibility, adaptability, and empathy. I cannot overemphasize that uh, more the importance of developing your psychological as well as social capital that will help building a trustful relationship with people from other parts of the world to cultivate a positive and constructive attitude towards diversity of thought and action. I just wonder if any of you have experienced so-called reverse culture shock, um, particularly, you know, Peace Corps experiences so profound and compelling I recently had an opportunity to meet with um, people uh, belong to the organization called the Friends of Korea. Um, most of them, they have participated in the Peace Corps uh, in South Korea in early 1980s or the late 70s and 60s and et cetera. So for those of you who participated in the study abroad program more than a semester, have you ever encountered so-called uh, reverse culture shock and you surprise yourself because I'm so much changed. I feel like that um, my home country is kind of <laughs> strange land without a boss. Anyone? No? Yeah, well, I would say um, all of the cliches about Peace Corps held true for me. And the most difficult thing about Peace Corps was the reverse, reverse culture shock. It was coming home. And uh, it was just so shocking, uh, just some of the little things, just to come back and from my perspective, just to see, um, you know, just the commercialization of everything, to just be inundated with, um, you know, buy, 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 and so much waste. And when I'm saying buy, 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 I mean consume, consume, consume. Um, and just the waste and the disconnectedness among people. Um, it was really difficult. I see. What about Dylan or Lisa? No? You're fine? Yeah, I, I, I definitely had reverse culture shock. Um, and I think it's, it's just a testament to how well you've adapted to where you were. 
that all of a sudden what used to be home and normal and you didn't even think about how to interact with people all of a sudden experiences become very jarring. I'm recalling shortly after I returned home, I was going to the supermarket and a woman in the parking lot who I never knew just commented like, oh, I really like your outfit. And I was completely thrown at having a stranger just address me out of the blue. It was very kind what she said, but I was just so not used to that very casual American interaction that we have. Um, you find your way eventually, but the best advice I got was to prepare yourself for it before you return. Um, I would not have done it if I hadn't had someone tell me, just know that it's going to be different and you just want to be ready for that. I think that that could be a, another topic we can talk about because I, you know, I myself that uh, experienced a reverse culture shock. And uh, so, well, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in spring 2022. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Before you leave, I would appreciate it if you could complete the short survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone. And good night, good morning, and good evening, depending upon where you are now. Thank you, everyone. Dylan, Lisa, Namdi, Charlie, and Gina. Thanks. Thank you so much.